What's up, Prime Fam? Welcome back to the YouTube channel, guys. We have the third installment in the SBD Assistance Exercise Tier List Series. So in the last two videos, we covered my favorite bench press assistance tier list exercises as well as some of my most hated. We ranked them from S tier down to D tier. We did the same thing for the deadlift in the previous video. And then now we have the squats. If you're new to the channel here, uh, I've been coaching powerlifting now for nine, almost coming up on 10 years professionally. I've done that as a full-time job the entire time. I've never worked anywhere else. I've achieved some pretty good lifts myself. My best total ever is 1,800 pounds in the gym. I have uh, just under a 500 Wilkes. I do have to qualify. It's like literally like one point less than a 500 Wilkes. We're going to be breaking that here in a few months. So I know a thing or two about powerlifting, but this video is not a video of authority. I uh, take you and I, I encourage you to just listen to my ranking of all the exercises for the squats assistance tier list. So this is going to be assistance exercises only. And I encourage you to hear what resonates with you and what doesn't, you know, disregard. I'm always a big believer that these tier list videos are a little cumbersome because they really are being ranked within the paradigm of my coaching programming modalities. So the way I program is going to heavily influence the way I rank these exercises. Some things may not resonate with you at all. And please, by all means, ignore it. You know through your own intuition if an exercise is good or not. Don't let anyone on YouTube tell you otherwise. But I'm going to give you my input and the way I program. And we're going to break down the nuance of every single exercise here on this list. And we even have a little bonus uh, round at the end with one thing I wanted to include, but technically couldn't. Now, without further ado, let's actually get into the exercises and rank them in no specific order from S to D tier. Okay, guys, so we have all the exercises down below here, and we're going to rank these. They're in no, no particular order, and I loosely thought about some of these ahead of time. I really am not doing this in any kind of a planned state. I never do. I like to give you guys my fresh input and thoughts as I go, and it may take me actually a little bit of time to think some of these through, so I encourage you to have patience, but I promise you it's going to be worth all the nuance I provide in this video, and we're going to start this off actually with one of my favorites that wasn't planned. We're going to talk about high bar squats. Now, if anyone has followed me, they know one, currently I'm actually high bar squatting as my main competition lift, but two, more importantly, I love high bar squats. These, without a doubt, are going to be an S tier. I don't even need to think about it. The high bar squats, if you are a low bar squatter, obviously this would only be an assistance exercise to low bar squatters. Um, this is one of the best builders for your squats. If I could only do one variation for low bar squatting for the rest of my life, it would be the high bar squat. This not only improves your quad strength, but a commonly missed uh, benefit of high bar squats is the benefit they have towards your T-spine and L-spine extensor isometric strength. So because the bar is higher up on your back, it actually puts far more demand, especially on the T-spine extensors to stay erect and tight while you're squatting. This is why people who squat high bar tend to pitch forward and dump a lot more. And you can even see their upper back rounds, especially in tall, lankier lifters. So the high bar squat is really good at just teaching an upright squat as well as getting your quads and upper back and just your overall core very strong and it's very easy to um, withstand volume in the high bar squat the reason i like programming this is like it doesn't bang up the shoulders and elbows like low bar squats do it's very similar to the low bar squats where it has a ton of specific carryover like literally if you do high bar squats your low bar squat will go up if you want proof of this take a complete beginner in the gym and have them max out their high bar squat. And then over the course of six months, have their high bar squat get stronger. I guarantee you, if you tested their low bar on day one, as well as their high bar, and then didn't have them do any low bar during that entire six months, if they tested low bar again, their low bar would be stronger. You could not say this for say something like a hack squat or a belt squat, right? You might not even be able to say it to the same degree as say front squats. The high bar has a ton of specific carryover. And it also trains like really non-specific functions, like it's way more quad and upper back dominant. So I just love high bar squats. Um, moving on now, pause squats out really quickly too. Before we get ahead, I do want to put a little catch in here. I kind of mentioned this in the intro, but again, when I talk about my favorite exercises here, we're talking about a tier list of assistance exercises. So it's worth noting that I don't have like accessory exercises on this video. So I'm not going to have like leg extensions, for instance, which I would actually argue leg extensions are great. Um, it's probably not going to be S tier, but it's a good squat accessory. Same thing with a lot of other un uh, like unilateral work and like 
you know, single joint exercises, but this is specifically what I consider assistance exercises, which are usually main variations of the squat itself or something very close to that. Now, moving on to pause squats, guys, um, one to two second pauses is really the majority of the time when I'm programming pause squats, I'm going to do one to two second pauses. I'm not placing this anywhere. I'm just kind of hovering and thinking about this out loud. I do do long pause work sometimes, and that has its place. And I would rank that separately, but specifically because it's so vastly different, a one to two second pause, I'm going to put this in a tier. This is one of my favorite exercises overall. It's probably one of my most prescribed exercises across all my different athletes. It really doesn't matter if you're a rank beginner or like a very advanced athlete, there is a purpose to doing pause squats. The, the majority of the benefit of pause squats is going to be increasing time under tension within the bottom position. This is going to help with mobility and stability in the bottom. It's going to help with comfort and technique as well as staying tight. If you do pause squats wrong, you'll notice very quickly. Now the key here is actually pausing for one to two seconds. So unfortunately, I think a lot of our Instagram heroes out there, uh, they love to pause for half a second where they're like saying, oh, big pause squat PR on their Instagram caption. And then you watch the video and you can't find where the pause is. You're not sure if they're pausing at all. This to me is completely useless. I would, if my lifters send me videos in during check-ins, if my one-on-one athletes or group coaching members, anyone sends me a video, even my friends that I don't coach, and they're doing a quarter second, half second pause. If I can't start a timer from the second they hit the bottom position and become, become motionless. So it's the second you become motionless for an entire second. If it's less than that, I'm going to give them shit because it's going to do basically nothing. I think at that point, honestly, I've done quick pause work with 98% of my one RM without a quick pause. Um, now on a 650 squat, that's actually a good bit of damage. That's about a 12 and a half pound change, but still like you can get really strong on shitty pause squats and they don't have anywhere near as much benefit. I really think the main benefit is spending a lot of time in the bottom position makes you feel ultra comfortable in your squat. So especially when someone's feeling out of whack on their squats, they're not feeling comfortable in the bottom position, their techniques off. That's always a go-to exercise. And I actually like them rather heavy too. you often find times for find me um, programming pause squats for anywhere from one to three, maybe four reps, um, you know, with heavy RPEs. I don't really go super high reps on those. It is worth noting. I didn't mention this on high bar. If we're talking about programming, I'm going to program high bar for anywhere from one to fucking 15 reps. Like high bar is very flexible. That's why it's S tier. You could do it for high volume. You could do it for heavy a million ways of doing it. Okay. Moving on to the next one, accommodating resistance. This is going to go in D tier. Um, I, every, every video, the guys who do speed work are going to hate me. Um, I just don't believe in accommodating resistance for power lifters, which is funny because I actually believe in doing speed work, but I don't do speed work in the way the West side method or, you know, the conjugate method has really perpetuated. So I do speed work on like split squats or athletic movements. I actually think being explosive and fast is important for powerlifting. A lot of people who have a very rudimentary understanding of physics and biomechanics would say that we're not actually power lifting because power is obviously the rate of force development, meaning how quickly you can develop your force, not how much force. Right. So they would argue, oh, it's ironically named powerlifting because um, it's ironic because we don't actually lift for power. We lift for total force production. However, it is worth noting that there is still an amount of work you need to overcome when performing an exercise through a full range of motion. And especially when it's a complex multi joint range of motion, you'll notice that if you can clear your sticking point faster, you have a better chance of staying in position and finishing the lift. Usually, what actually goes wrong on a lot of people's one RM attempts is they slow down and get hit so hard during the sticking point that they end up moving out of position or even giving up is really common in intermediates and speed work can, can benefit this, but I don't believe in doing this with bands and chains. I don't think that's actually going to really help you that much. You probably could, you know, again, take what resonates with you. I just don't program that way. Instead, what I'll have someone do is like one arm assisted split squats with a dumbbell in another hand and being ultra explosive. This is going to increase stability and power at the same time. And it's not going to fatigue or take away from your actual squat training that you could be put uh, being 
be putting work towards hypertrophy or strength adaptation. Okay. So I'm not going to waste time squatting on a barbell that isn't directly going towards increasing my squat or increasing my leg size to later increase my squat. I'm going to spend that time doing actual squat work that's strength or hypertrophy dominant or work capacity dominant. I won't be doing quote unquote speed work. This doesn't mean from time to time, I don't enter repetition ranges and intensity zones that end up being very explosive and fast, but that isn't the whole sole purpose of doing it. And I definitely don't add accommodating resistance to it. I'm not adding bands or chains. Okay. Moving on to the next one, range of motion change. Um, so this is going to be your 1.5 squats, your above parallel pause squats, or even your above parallel squats, like something where you're changing the range of motion. You know, some people do one and a quarter squats. There's all sorts of different ways of doing this. I'm going to go C tier here. It's not even because it's a bad um, idea. I actually do like 1.5 and 1.25 squats. It's a great way to build your quads, but it's not something I like program on a regular basis. And it's not something like to me when I'm ranking these exercises, I'm thinking utility for everyone. Like I really rank this in the, the thought process of like, how often do I prescribe this to my athletes? And like, how is, how often is this like a staple? I rarely, I, I wouldn't say rarely, I would say maybe like one out of 10 athletes, I'll program on a regular basis, like 1.25 or 1.5 squats. And oftentimes it's honestly just for some novel stimuli. Sometimes it is for increasing quad strength and, and hypertrophy. And the reason why is because the bottom range of motions where the majority of the work is done in a squat, um, as you ascend up, the resistance is heavily limited or excuse me, lessened. It's heavily lessened as you ascend up out of the hole and get near lockout because obviously leverage. So there's, a good argument to be made that if you spend more time in the bottom position and less time fucking around in the middle top position that like you could really burn the quads out that way. And that is true to an extent, but it's not something I do on a regular basis. Generally speaking, I would say just do more total squats if you really want to build the quads, but that is a tool in your arsenal. Zerker squats D tier. I, someone, someone unorthodox. So again, guys, take what resonates with you. Maybe you disagree. I've never once heard any high level athlete say, man, my squat really blew up this off season because I did Zerker squats. It's a, it's a, it's a carnival act to me. Honestly, it's a cool one. I think Zerker squats are crazy. When I see people doing like four or five, 500 pound Zerker squats, I've done them that they are really taxing on the back and the core and the quads. Um, you get like this really weird sensation from them. Um, I just don't think they're very useful if I'm honest. Like I really don't. Um, I think they're, What's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're novel, they're fun, but there's just zero utility to them. I don't think they're going to have much carry over to your main squats. Moving on, tempo work. Um, shit, this is either S or A tier. Let me think about this. Tempo work's amazing. I think almost anyone can do it. I'm going to say S tier. I think tempo work is like one of, it's something I program to pretty much all my squatters at some point in their training career. I think as you get more advanced, the main reason you would do tempo work is to work on um, load management and healthy joints. Um, this is something Chance Mitchell I know did pretty much every off season for the last few off seasons. He always starts his squat um, sessions or his squat like um, mesocycles in the early off season or whatever you want to call it, you know, right after a meet with a lot of tempo work. I did the same thing for years. These days I don't do that as much because I tend to move almost too slow in my squat. Like if anything, I'm trying to speed it up, but especially beginners and intermediates can get the benefit of slowing down and being mindful of their form. Now, I think because humans are very utilitarian and humans are very materialistic, we tend to view exercises in a like almost like chemistry like basis. So what I mean by that is generally in chemistry, you're seeing how chemicals react, right? And I feel like that's how people like view exercise selection. They think, oh, how is this exercise going to instantly affect my squats? Meaning like, okay, I do high bar that makes quads and back stronger. Cool. That instantly affects my squat. Tempo work works more in a um, like roundabout way in the sense that like you're not really getting any benefits from the actual elongated time under tension. There are, of course, some the longer your centric is, the more muscle breakdown and blah, blah, blah. But generally, tempo work works up here. It, it slows you down so your mind can be more aware. And I would argue that's more important than like just direct utility strength carryover in a specific muscle group that gets a little bit more stimulated in a squat variant compared to say doing tempo work, which allows you to move better. I think the number one thing that's propelled my squat 
is my ability to squat with really good technique for my anatomy. I'm six feet tall. I'm extremely lanky. I have a hard time squatting, not just to depth, but like just controlling the squat. Like squats were my nemesis when I first started lifting because I tried so hard on them to get better at them. I've I've allowed my squat to be like a pretty decent lift. And I think one of the main things I've really worked on is definitely tempo work throughout my training career. Next one, pin squats and Anderson squats. I'm going to put in these in C tier. Um, I almost want to put these in D tier. Truthfully, if it's me, I just don't use these, but I know a lot of coaches who do. So I I feel bad putting them in D tier. Um, I just don't think there's much utility to a pin squat. I don't see too many high level, um, you know, lifters using these, and I don't see too many intermediates using this exercise to get to the advanced level. And I definitely don't think you should be doing these as a beginner. Like, I think the argument is very clear there. Like beginners just don't know how to squat. Why are you going to make them squat to a pin? It's actually pretty complex to do that with good stability. So like, you're really arguing, okay, can we use this for intermediates or advanced lifters? I don't, I don't think it's going to have much utility, but then, you know, there's a lot of a lot of coaches who would argue otherwise. And these are coaches who I, I, I listen to. So I'm not going to just completely throw it out. I think David Wilson really likes these. I want to say, and it makes sense. He's a wide stance squatter and that I could see like how he would like the utility here. I remember him using these and talking about them a while ago. Don't know if he still does. I just don't program them too often. I'm very big on strength and size. Like I'm thinking, okay, how do I get my legs ultra jacked? How do I stay mobile and healthy? And how do I get fucking strong? Pin squats are one of those things where it's almost like, okay, we're going to make you put the weight down on the pins and you're going to have to stay ultra fucking tight. So it's kind of like a mindful exercise, kind of like tempo work. It's going to make you ultra mindful of staying tight. But the thing is, is like, there's a lot of ways to improve your technique and your muscle activation and awareness without having to do pin squats. So like, that's kind of my argument is like where one coach would use a pin squat for improving technique, or they might use an Anderson squat for improving like strength coming out of the hole. I think pause squats or tempo work would actually fix those things better. So that's kind of my argument there. Um, Plat squats, which is really anything heel elevated. So these could be high bar plat squats, front plat squats, low bar plat squats. Don't really care. Just your heels super elevated, uh, usually in a pretty close stance. I don't do these wide, although you could. Um, And really all variants here. I'm going to put this, whoops, let me move that back. Sorry, I was grabbing the wrong thing. I'm going to put this in A tier here. Um, I think plat squats... I didn't really start doing these till the year 2020. That was when I really got into plat squats and I would do these things all the fucking time. And since then I've programmed them on a regular consistent basis for all my lifters. So I think plat squats are really amazing. They're going to increase your quad um, strength and hypertrophy, but more importantly, they're working end range position. You guys saw my sarcastic video where I was talking about all the useless work I do for my squat because someone in a video was like, you don't need to do these exercises. Like just squat more if you want to get your squat stronger. And that's, that's such a dumb mindset guys. It really is. The one thing I'll say that you can't disagree with on this video is like anyone who says that is someone who has not coached a lot of lifters because you can't just only squat. You can't just only do squat and pause squats and some tempo work. You got to fucking change up your bar positions. You got to target the body from different areas. The human body's all about balance. This doesn't mean you can't heavily preferentiate your work towards regular squats, but there's definitely a time and a place for plat squats and like heel elevated variants with like a closer stance. And I'm telling you the health benefits in your quad tendons and your ankle joint, they will fucking thank you. You will be so much more indestructible. I wish I did these more early on front squats, a tier. I want to put these S tier. I would put a mess tier for me. I don't have a mess tier for all my lifters. I think the front squat I apply to every athlete under me does front squats. Every athlete under me is strong at front squats, at least in, in regards to their anatomy. Um, I've heard high level lifters say, oh, you have to go so much lighter. It has no carryover. I've heard them say, oh, it's the most useless exercise for the back squat. I couldn't disagree more. Everyone who says, oh, high level power lifters don't do it. Well, I present to you the sport of weightlifting, the thing where not only are they supposed to squat all the time, but they're having to squat in a very upright position. I would find it very hard to argue that squatting more upright in relation to your anatomy. So I don't mean like forcing an upright position that's actually not applied to your biomechanics, which can actually be bad for you. I mean, squatting upright and staying vertical, meaning staying in your quads as you ascend. So the knees don't shoot back, staying in your glutes and keeping that open hip ankle, staying in your back and core positions. So your back and core are not rounding and giving out. Being able to do that is a benefit. 
if you're trying to argue that I don't understand what your argument is, are you saying that you can tip over and that's just as strong if you stay in position? So to me, a front squat is the barometer for ensuring you don't tip. It's the exercise that forces you to do this. And I actually think a lot of high level powerlifters have inadequate squats, but because they're really genetically gifted, their squats look strong on paper, but I think they would be even stronger if they moved in better positions and something that would really would have helped them early on were front squats. At some point I would actually make the argument it's a case far too gone, or at least like you would have to be really patient. Like if you've built a 650, 700 pound squat, on fucking like a house of stilts and like you have to only low bar with a super low bar position and you're super hip dominant and you let your hips just glide and move all over the place. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be able to fix that for a very long time. So I would just keep doing what you're doing. But I say, if you implement front squats early on, it's going to be one of the best exercises for carryover. It annihilates the quads and the core and the upper back in a way that is very hard to accomplish any other way that is specific to squatting. So here's the irony. Most people argue it's not specific that are against front squats. You usually have one or the other crowd. You have the people who hate front squats and people who love front squats. I'm definitely one of the ones who loves them. You rarely see like an in-between on this exercise. And generally they say they're not specific enough. And to me, it's like, what does that mean? What does specific mean? Like you basically, you would say then the only thing you should do is tempo work and plat squats or excuse me, tempo work and pause squats, because those are the most specific, forget the high bar, forget all these bar positions changes or free even machine squats it's one of the least specific exercises but almost every high level power lifter does machine squats so it's like okay why hate on front squats well they're not understanding specific is fluid so if someone has a specific squat problem of dumping in the squat guess what the one exercise that doesn't allow you to do that that really trains you to stay upright the front squat so to me it's like just honestly a mind blow that people don't front squat more. My best front squat was 505 or 500, something around there. And it was relatively easy. And that was when I was back squatting like 630, 640. So like you can get pretty fucking strong at these two. Half field squats. Um, I'll put these in C tier. I rarely do these. I programmed these for my client Dima not too long ago. He really liked them. Dan Green tried to turn me on to these. I just didn't see much utility in them. It's basically where you're holding on to something while you have an SSB squat on your back and you're just going up and down. I, I don't really get it. You know, it helps with balance, but then like you're, you're getting so much tension removed out of the lift by holding on. And guys, if you think even just placing your hands on something isn't really severely helping you, First off, that would mean people can touch your bench press while you're doing a PR and it wouldn't really help you as long as their hand's just placing. We all know that's not true. But secondly, go on a scale in your house and stand on that scale and then lightly rest your hand on the counter and watch how many pounds come off that scale. And then firmly press both hands onto the counter, not like hard, but just press them firm. You're going to see that scale change by lots of poundage. And when you're talking about holding on to that thing while you're going down, like these are just going to remove so much tension that I don't, I don't really get it. The only thing it really does is it changes you to allow to squat in a position that's not really possible to achieve. But then I would argue Smith machine squats might be a replacement there. Those aren't on this exercise um, tier list precisely, but that does bring me to the next one, machine squats, which includes Smith machine, includes belt squats, includes hack uh, squats, includes leg press, everything you can think of. And I'm going to actually put these in S tier. I think these are really, really amazing. I, these are, again, I don't use these as a main progressor unless someone's injured. So I never have this as like the first exercise in the day, but literally in almost every protocol I write, like almost every single one, even peaking blocks, even off season, there's going to be some kind of machine squatting work in there to really annihilate the legs more without getting more back fatigue. They're just, that's like the main purpose of them. And it, it, it does let you achieve positions that are really hard to get into. So like a Smith machine squat, this gets complex, but because of the force vector that gets created, you can put your feet way in front of you, which if you don't understand force vectors, you think, oh, that removes your quads. No, the opposite, because you're pressing back and it creates a force vector, it actually increases your quad activation by moving your feet way in front of you. And so you get this really cool quad exercise that you can't really recreate any other way. Um, so Smith machine squats are actually really cool. I think they get way too much hate. Same thing, hack squats, you can get in some cool positions. Leg press is really good. 
Um, box squats, man, D tier. These are just going down here. It's, I don't for for getting your squat stronger. I don't think there's a purpose. I could see for actually like glute and um, core hypertrophy. Funny enough, they're amazing. Like these will light up your core and glutes if you do them correctly. I do like them with the soft touch. But honestly, what's so funny about that is I like box squats for for bodybuilding way more than I do for powerlifting. For for actual raw squatters, they do nothing. And for anyone who wants to argue about West Side, again, guys. Take what resonates with you, but West Side really was fundamentally geared lifting. Like they didn't use, they didn't have raw lifters. Like box squats got popular from guys who are not squatting raw. I just don't think it helps. I don't, again, I don't think you see high level lifters doing this exercise. And I don't think that's just the argument. Like, again, I disagree with a lot of what high level lifters do. But what I really look at is, did any high level lifters use box squats to get where they're at? Most of them did not. However, I know a lot of high level lifters who use front squats or used other things like that high bar work, et cetera, but don't really use it anymore. And that for some reason they've changed their mind on that stuff, even though it was a huge proponent of their early years of training. And so that's kind of how I view these. And then I also, again, view it from the paradigm. How often do I program them? Not very often. Stance chain is going to be stance change and with, you know, wider stance, narrower stance, going deeper, like going narrow ass to grass squats. These are B tier. These are great for building the quads. I really like narrow high bar stance squats going super ass to grass. Great way to just improve your squat explosiveness, quad strength, and your work capacity. Um, naked squats also B tier. I use these pretty often in the off season. I'll, I'll remove um, knee sleeves and belt and have them, uh, or just knee sleeve or just belt, you know, some amalgamation of that. I don't mean actually having them squatting naked. Um, you know, just removing gear is a good way to reduce load and force them to be ultra mindful. And then on top of that training, their end range positions. So when you train, your knees without knee sleeves, you actually hit the hole with your knee joint doing everything. Normally knee sleeves get that compressive reactive force in the hole where they stretch. And that actually prevents your knee tendons from getting all the brunt of the load, which is why people say, Oh, my knees feel better when I squat with knee sleeves, but that's like a short term feels better. Like keep in mind, if you were to keep doing that over the course of like years and years, you could actually probably develop weaker. You definitely will develop weaker knee tendons in the bottom position. So sometimes removing knee sleeves is actually very beneficial. Now we have one last exercise here. That's technically not an, I don't consider this a direct assistance lift. I consider this accessory work, but it's so important. I wanted to put it on this list. That's you unilateral squatting. So I'm going to explain. So, so this means lunges, split squats or Bulgarian split squats, front foot, elevated split squats, Cossack squats, anything unilateral in nature. And these are amazing. I would put these in a tier. Um, the reason I really like these is they basically keep you healthy. They keep you mobile. Like if you have problems hitting depth, all, any guy who's come to me, any guy or girl, it's usually guys that come to me and they're like, I can't hit depth Cossack squats within weeks. They're hitting fluid depth, like perfectly. Right. Next thing I, I love split squats. They have tight interior hips, boom, split squats. All of a sudden it clears up a lot of their hip rotation pain in the bottom hole position. Um, stability issues, fixes stability issues, glute activation, like all sorts of crazy shit, man. Like, like unilateral work is so important. I couldn't leave it off the list. So I wanted to include it there. And that is the tier list videos. Now, if you guys are interested in programming from me directly, um, I'm offering still one-on-one -on -one coaching spaces. I'm being very patient uh, with onboarding clients. We've had a lot of people sign up for the meetings here over the last few months. I'm making sure I find the perfect fit. So if you guys want to hop on a meeting with me and talk to me directly one-on-one -on -one about your goals, dude, this is not me selling you on the meeting or pitching you and like trying to get you to sign up. In fact, the opposite. I'm making sure that if we work together, we're going to be an awesome kick-ass fit. I don't like taking on an athlete and then three months in, one of us realizes, ah, this isn't the best fit. We have very different outlooks on training and stuff. And then we part ways. That's just a waste of both of our times and a waste of your money. So if you guys are interested in talking to me one-on-one -on -one to see if you would be a good fit for my coaching system, what I do during these meetings is I sit down and I showcase everything I do for athletes and how my whole coaching system works. It is vastly different than any other coach right now in the game period. There's no one who has a coaching system like me. I can show you that. Now that's the problem though. It doesn't fit everyone. So for those of you who doesn't fit, you actually might be a great fit for a group coaching, which is far more affordable 
and you still get a kick-ass customizable program that's customized by the user yourself, but led by a bunch of videos that I put out for our private members on our website. So if you want access to content similar to the squat video, every single week we drop fucking videos, guys, on our website. We're putting out a video about the squat and some of the positions um, that are most optimal and cues most optimal for the squat this week. That's going to be going live, I think, tomorrow on Wednesday. Um, we're going to be dropping a ton of videos here in the future. We do program breakdowns, and you really get a very customized and awesome experience for an affordable rate. So if you're interested in the group coaching, go sign up on the website directly. You can use the links below. And if you're not sure if you want to do one-on-one -on -one or group coaching, and then sign up with a meeting for me, okay? Um, that's pretty much the video, guys. Love y'all. Catch you guys in the next video.